Good morning. Isn't it great to be together? And isn't it great to have the sun coming through the windows? I know for some of you, it, it may interfere slightly, but this, don't, don't complain about it. Uh, we need the sun, and it's good to have, have it with us today. Great to have you here. Uh, if you're visiting with us, you're especially welcome. Remind you all that we have tea and coffee afterwards, and you don't really need to go anywhere to get your tea and coffee this morning. Uh, it'll be happening here. Uh, but thank you. What's, what do you mean no? Oh, you still have to go. Oh, you still have to work for your tea and coffee. You just don't have so far to go. All right. That's my apologies. I want to read a few verses from uh, Psalm 103. We've been looking at these this morning. And this is from Eugene Peterson's translation. O oh, my soul, bless God. From head to toe, I'll bless his holy name. O my soul, bless God, and forget not a single blessing. He forgives your sins, every one. He heals your diseases, every one. He redeems you from hell, saves your life. He crowns you with love and mercy, a paradise crown. He wraps you in goodness, beauty eternal. He renews your youth. You're always young in his presence. We use the word bless quite a lot, don't we? And very often we want to use that word that others might be blessed by God. God bless you, we would say. And in that use of the word bless, we are asking for God to do something for that other person that will encourage them, that will comfort them, that will strengthen them. But sometimes we also use the word bless as a way to say thank you. Oh, bless you. That was so kind. In the Bible, we read a lot about God blessing us. But we also read in the Bible about the call and the invitation for us to bless God. Now, that might seem rather strange. We need all the blessing we can get. We know that we are frail and fragile and full of faults and we struggle. We need all the blessing we can get. So, why would we bless God? We bless God as a thanksgiving. We bless God rejoicing in who He is, celebrating His goodness and His greatness. And that's what we're going to do now. We're going to stand or sit as you choose, and we're going to sing two pieces uh, back to back. Uh, the first of these is crown Him with many crowns, a celebration of Jesus, our Savior, risen Lord. And then we're going to sing, praise my soul, the King of heaven. And that is based on Psalm 103. The hymn writer took this psalm as his inspiration to write that hymn. Now, they are long hymns. They have five, six verses each. But don't panic. We're only going to sing a few verses out of each one. But let's stand and let's bless God with our worship this morning. <laughs>
please take your seats. Let's take a moment to pray together. Can we do that? Let's pray. Loving God, our gracious, our heavenly Father, we come today to bless your name. We come today to bless you. We come with thanksgiving. We come with gratitude. We come with rejoicing because of who you are and because of what you have done. We come because you're a God of promise and a God who keeps his promises. We come because you're a God of power and a God who releases his power into our world and into our lives. You're a God of pardon. A God who hears the cries of our hearts, the confession of our lips, and you forgive us. And you're a God of peace. A God who so loved us that you sent Jesus to be our peace. To restore that which was broken and make it whole. We come and we gather in Jesus' name. In the name of the one who gave himself for us. In the name of the one who rose again and is alive, is Lord of all. In the name of the one who is our Savior and our Lord. We come in his name to bless, to worship, to praise you. Heavenly Father, we are easily distracted. We are distracted by the sunshine through the windows. We're distracted by the sound and the visuals. We're distracted by the temperature, too hot, too cold. We are easily distracted. So we ask that your Holy Spirit would come and fade those distractions away. That we might turn our eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face and let the things of earth grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. We pray in his name and ask your blessing now. Amen. This morning we have with us Ben, who's going to come up and join me. And I'm going to give you this, Ben, you could hold on to it. Thank you. Now, Ben is going to be with us for the next six weeks, yeah, six, six, seven weeks. weeks, something like that. So before we say any more about that, Ben, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, my name's Ben. I'm 25 years old. I live just up the road in Dundonald. And I'll get this out of the way. I'm a Man United fan. Um, yeah. I don't know. Is that, that doesn't always go down well. Um, With me, it does. Yeah, good. Um, I also enjoy uh, playing some golf, uh, which I'm also terrible at. Um, but um, And enjoy music. And really, really love going to the cinema as well. So that's the main things. Man United, love it. It's all. It's all good. <laughs> well, not, not actually, it's not good at the moment. No, it's not as good as it yes. can be. But we, we live in hope, Ben. Yeah. We live in hope. So after school, 
tell us what you what you did. I, I went to university in Jordanstown for four years, and I studied marketing. Uh, and then after that, I well, I go on. To yeah, please. That, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. After that, I graduated in um, 2020. It was, and I felt like I had a bit of time um, to give to to serve um, before I maybe went and got a job in marketing. And so I went to uh, Dublin uh, to the church called Hoth and Malahide, and well, just outside of Dublin. Um, and I spent three years there as their youth intern. Um, I only came back in the summer there. And I really, really enjoyed my time there. I loved it. Uh, I just loved working with the, the youth and spending time with that church and really getting to know them over those three years. Ben, tell us why you're here and what you hope to gain from your six weeks with us. Well, this, this uh, well, from September, I had applied for the uh, ministry, I applied for the ministry through Union, and as part of that, we do a couple of placements, and I, just before Christmas, was in Casseray Presbyterian for four weeks and had a great, great time there. And now I'm here in Stormont, and I'm really looking forward to getting to know you guys um, and, and over these next six weeks. Uh, this process is a long process, and it's great that we get these opportunities to go to different contexts and different churches and really explore um, the call uh, to ministry that I do feel I have um, all my life. Um, but, of course, only, only God knows that, and his will, you know, will be done either for me to go into ministry or to not do that, and I just sort of submit myself to that and to whatever plan he has for my life. Yeah. Ben, we are delighted to have you here. We, we love having people who are on a journey. We love being able to accompany people on a journey. Um, you said you're not very good at golf. <laughs> you might discover there are one or two others who are not. I mean, yeah. they are very good at golf. Yeah. I, I might be able to offer you a tip yeah. or two. Um, but we, we really want to to welcome you, say you. it's great to have you. Um, we're going to be praying for you. So easy to remember, his name is Ben Kirkwood. Now we've heard that name before. So please make that part of your daily prayers. Pray for Ben uh, as he spends time just discovering a bit more about ministry and then sharing with us on Sundays as well. And he'll be preaching it on a couple of occasions too. Ben, I'm going to pray with you just now before you, you take your seat. Father, we, we thank you for your church, and we thank you that as you invite us into your church, so you equip us to serve as part of your church. We thank you for the journey that Ben has been on uh, through school, through university, uh, this placement, uh, this internship in Hoth and Malahide, and now this, this journey uh, in terms of ministry. Father, our prayer for Ben is that he will uh, enjoy and be, feel the welcome here. We pray also that things will be clarified for him as he continues this journey, that you will make your will and your purpose so clear and so obvious that it will be straightforward for him to keep moving. Uh, we pray that you will help us as a church family uh, to welcome Ben in, to encourage and bless him in this journey. And all this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Ben, thanks very much. Can we bring up... Oh, yes. Thanks, Dennis. I forgot about that. Okay, we'll do that now, actually. Why do we do that now? Well, we, we'll say the Lord's Prayer together. Uh, we, we do this, we, we say this prayer because it unites us. Uh, we say this prayer because it's a prayer that Jesus taught his followers to say. Uh, so will you join me and we'll use the words that are on the screen and let's do that. Our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today the food we need and forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those who sin against us. 
And don't let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I'm so used to having a screen in front of me that uh, I didn't notice that. Dennis, can you take us through to the, uh, to the uh, uh, announcements? That'd be great. So this afternoon, we're hosting Messy Church here uh, from 4 o'clock through to 6 uh, we'd love you to be part of that and to bring others with you. We'll be doing lots of crafts uh, related to the theme of, of Joseph and, and his coat and his journey. And then we'll go through the church for some worship and then we'll come back in here uh, to have some food together. We're due, we do it with our friends from St. Malou's, but we're hosting today. Uh, on uh, Tuesday afternoon, um, in Kirkara, um, our Presbyterian women are meeting, and uh, the guest speaker is around here somewhere. Um, Chris is, is going to be uh, speaking on uh, Tuesday afternoon, so do come and join, join them for that at two o'clock. Uh, a huge thank you for, again, your awesome generosity. We, uh, we, we, I just love these kind of announcements. Uh, so remember, we had our World Development Appeal uh, as we uh, were seeking to help others um, give hope to the displaced. Well, we were able to send off £4,558.75. That's all been forwarded to PCI, and we'll go to our partners um, to bring a real difference uh, to a lot of people. So thank you for your blessings. Uh, this coming Friday, uh, we join with the other churches in this area, in the Belmont Churches Together group, um, as we celebrate Christian unity. Um, and our friends at St. Malua's are hosting this. Um, kick, it starts at 7 o'clock. Uh, there'll be lots of, of music. Um, there'll be some reflections on the journey of the Belmont churches together over uh, the past 50 years. Uh, there'll be some refreshments as well, uh, but a real opportunity uh, to celebrate the fact that God brings us together in Christ. Uh, so we encourage you to come to that on Friday evening, 7 o'clock in St. Malua's. And now Jim's going to come and lead us in our prayers. Jim. There you go. Let us pray. Let us shut out everything except the quiet peace of God's presence. Ease our minds. Help us not to worry about past concerns or what lies ahead, but to rest assured in the knowledge that you, God, hold our past, our future, and those of our family and friends in your caring hands. Strengthen us to step forward in faith, trusting that your timing is perfect for all our needs. Show us the steps you want us to take steps which encourage each of us to bring support, joy, and peace to all we meet. Heavenly Father, we pray as we must for your world, created by you in beauty, love, and peace, and yet today we grieve over the anger, fear, and endless suffering that has gripped so many of its parts in Ukraine, in Palestine, and Israel. Caring Heavenly Father, Bring hope to millions in danger and despair. Fill world leaders with your compassion, justice for all, and a desire to be your instruments for good in all troubled lands. Lay your healing hands on the suffering. Give strength to the caring services, putting the welfare of others before their own. Bring comfort to the bereaved and companionship those more lonely than ever before. Loving God, we pray that hatred is set aside for understanding, that the suffering of the innocent be matched by the measure of your loving care. Remind world leaders of the oneness of the human race. Give people everywhere a lasting hope of a world without war. Come quickly, Lord. Oh, come quickly to heal your broken world. And in praying for peace on earth, let not other emergencies, such as those caused by climate change, be minimized. Earthquakes, floods, fires, droughts, together causing countless injury, death, 
and measurable physical damage. Shine your light of hope in the midst of such despair and stir our hearts into action to play our part in the fight against climate change in our homes and communities, small individually, but collectively significant. Heavenly Father, we pray for our own land in Northern Ireland as it continues its faltering steps to self-government. Continue to implant within our politicians a togetherness in which tribal ideals are a past memory, a togetherness to serve the common good, a togetherness that cherishes justice with health services an urgent priority. Dispel the rejectionists in their midst. Heavenly Father, we pray with earnest hearts for our congregation here at Stormont. We give thanks for the tireless leadership of our minister, Alban, his family circle, and the support team around them as they lead us along Christ's faithful way. Sustain those of our members who feel the heaviness of life, a growing challenge, those who are ill, anxious, lonely, those who grieve the loss of a loved one, whether recently or as each anniversary passes. Uphold each in your gentle, loving arms. Be close to our young people. Let us never be indifferent to their needs and hasten the day when they can leave uncertainty behind. These prayers we offer in your name. Amen. Thanks, Jim. We're going to stand now as we sing together, O oh, to see the dawn.
Bible reading this morning is taken from Mark chapter 8, verses 31 through to chapter 9, verse 1. This is the word of God. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. And he said to them, Truly, I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see that the kingdom of God has come with power. Amen. And we thank God for his word. Now, for those of you who were here last week, you might remember where we were in Mark's Gospel. For those of you who weren't, let me um, bring you up to speed. Uh, So Jesus was having a conversation with his disciples, and he asked them two very particular questions. One question was, who do people say I am? And the second question was, who do you say I am? And Peter gave this answer. Oh, my slides aren't there. That's okay. You are the Christ. Four words was Peter's answer. And it was a a watershed moment for the disciples. And as we're going to see as we walk through the remainder of uh, chapter 8, this was also going to be a turning point in Mark's gospel presentation. Is is there a little bit of feedback? Can I, uh, Colin, can you? Do you think it's that? Do you think that one's interrupting or interfering? Oh, maybe it's because it's going into the speaker. Would that be it? There we go. Hmm? Yes, that, that, that one's off. And that one's on. Isn't it? Yes, that one's on. Can you hear me? Great. Now, can everybody hear me? Yes? Okay, great. All right. So you are the Christ. Four words that Peter gave by way of answer. A watershed moment for the disciples because it appeared anyway at that moment that they'd got it, that they got who Jesus was. And for Mark, as he writes this gospel, this serves as the the pivot moment in his presentation. Up to this point, Mark has been focused through story, through metaphor, through conversation and dialogue, to explore the question, who is Jesus? From this point on, he's going to move that focus. He started his gospel by saying, this is the beginning of the gospel, about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now he wants us 
to understand what it means for Jesus to be the Christ. We've now established that he is the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one. But what does that mean? What does it mean for Jesus? And what does it mean for you and me? And Jesus, as he begins to do this, provokes a really strong reaction from his disciples. So if you've got the reading in front of you there, um, or on your phone, or you've got a a physical Bible in your hands, then turn to, to Mark 8, please. In verse 32, this is what we read. He spoke plainly about this what it was going to mean for him to be uh, the Christ. And then we read, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan. He said, you do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Now, the word rebuke that's used here of Peter towards Jesus and of Jesus towards Peter is the same word used of Jesus when he was addressing the demons. So this wasn't a quiet word in your ear. Come here to have a wee word with you. It wasn't that kind of a conversation. Had there been a minute written of this conversation, the minute might have read, there was a full and frank exchange of views. This was a no, hold, no, no holding of punches back kind of conversation. But so what was it then? What was it that stirred such a reaction in Peter? What was it that caused Jesus to push back on Peter with such ferocity? Well, look at verse 31. This is the crux of this whole conversation. He began to teach them, that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law. And they, they must be killed, and after three days, rise again. Three words I want you to grasp in that, in that little um, portion. Suffer, rejected, killed. What Jesus was describing didn't square with the disciples' understanding or their expectation of the Messiah. Jesus' use of the word must, not once but twice, adds to Peter's bewilderment and horror. Now, we might be separated from this by 2,000 years and over 3,000 miles. But for many, the idea that Jesus had to suffer, had to be rejected, had to be killed, is both repulsive and unreasonable. If God is all-powerful, if God is love, then why would he not simply forgive? Why did Jesus have to undergo such a barbaric death. What father would do that to his son? As we step slowly and carefully through this passage today, there are two takeaways that I have for you. The first is the cost to Jesus of fulfilling the role of Christ and the cost to those who follow Jesus the Christ. Okay, let's, let's take a closer look. Look at verse 31, and then look at verse 38. What do you notice? You notice the repetition of the phrase, Son of Man. Here's Mark, once again, employing his bookend approach. In other words, we need to pay attention to the fact that he's using these two terms, because what lies within is going to help us understand those terms. The term Son of Man is used 80 times in the Gospels, always by Jesus, 
and always about himself. It points to his humanity, but it also points to God's promises, promises that we find in the Old Testament. Now, a couple of weeks ago, Thomas made reference to Daniel chapter 7, and I want to read you again that little reference. Daniel is having another of these visions that God gives to him. And he writes, In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority and glory and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. In this vision in Daniel, God is letting Daniel have a look ahead to the end of the story. You ever do that? You ever buy a new book? And before you read the first page, you flick to the end just to see how it's going. Oh, do you not do that? Sometimes I do that. And then I try and work out how they're going to get from here to there. It's another way of reading a book, Barbara. It's really good. Try it. So God is showing Daniel this vision of the end, the kingdom of God coming. And the figure referred to as being like a son of man is central, key, This is the figure that's going to make this all happen, and through this figure, God is going to act. His promises are going to be fulfilled. And that Son of Man figure is both human and divine. And Jesus is that figure in that vision. He's the Son of Man who's come to usher in the kingdom of God. And his own words make that clear. Go back to Mark 1, verse 15, the verse that we all learn together. Can you remember learning that verse one Sunday morning? The time has come. The kingdom is near. Repent and believe the good news. Now, at the time when Jesus was on earth and ministering and in his mission and bringing his message, there wasn't a unified understanding of Messiah within the the Jewish population. Certainly the disciples wouldn't have been aware of a unified understanding. There was some thought that a Messiah would be a victorious figure, a powerful figure, perhaps even the figure that would bring the nation back to sovereign status again. But there was certainly no thought ever given to the Messiah as one who would suffer. No thought given to the Messiah as one who'd be rejected. And certainly, above everything else, no thought ever given that the Messiah would be killed. Who would think of such a thing? How could a Messiah do what a Messiah has to do and be killed? That thought had never entered their heads. And yet Jesus is emphatic here. He says that the Son of Man must suffer and be rejected. Must be killed. So Jesus leaves no doubt that what he speaks of here and what will be unfolding in the coming days of his life will not be a tragic accident. It will not be a miscarriage of justice. And it will not be an unforeseen outcome. Quite the contrary. The use of that word must determines the meaning of the sentence. It controls, it modifies all that comes after it. Jesus here is speaking of events that are preordained, planned, and on purpose. Now, I don't know whether you noticed, as Ben read it to us, 
or whether you notice it now as you look at those verses. But there's a reference to the resurrection in Jesus' words. He doesn't just talk about suffering. He doesn't just talk about about, um, rejection. He doesn't just talk about being killed. He then says, and be raised to life again. But it seems that that passed Peter by. It just went whoosh. Maybe like most of this sermon is doing for some of you, just whoosh. Peter can't hear the hope here. The hope that can, comes with the sacrifice. The hope that is the result of the sacrifice. It's only going to be much later when the events have taken place and when Peter and his companions have had time to reflect that they can grasp why this journey was necessary and the consequence of that for those who believe in Jesus the Christ. For now, as Jesus outlines what's going to happen, Peter gets really disturbed. He wants to dissuade Jesus of this. Peter thinks this is the wrong way. Peter says no. That's got an echo somewhere, doesn't it? We've heard that phrase before, haven't we? Peter says no. Now, this is the second occasion that Jesus faces the temptation to turn from God's plan and purpose. In Mark chapter 1, if you can remember back that far, we looked at it way back in July, Jesus was baptized, and God the Father spoke these words over him, you are my beloved son, with you I'm well pleased. But after that, it's the devil who tempts Jesus to turn his back on what God has called him to be and to do. Here in Mark 8, it's Peter who seeks to dissuade. And yet, notice that Jesus sees this as also the hand of the devil at work. Get behind me, Satan. The path is not going to be easy. Jesus knows that. But it is necessary. And therefore, no one and nothing will stop Jesus fulfilling the Father's will. Now, what Jesus speaks of here in verses 32 and uh, verse, verse 31, rather, is the first of three occasions that Mark records him talking about what's going to happen in terms of suffering, in terms of rejection, in terms of death. Mark 9, 31. Jesus says, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days he will rise. And in Mark 10, 45, Jesus says, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Now, we take those three references together, the one that we read this morning in Mark 8, the one that comes up in Mark 9, and the one that comes up in Mark 10. We can begin to see in Jesus' own words why suffering and rejection and death was necessary. Namely, there's a problem to which there's a plan, and that plan comes at a price. A problem. Jesus uses in Mark 10 this word ransom. And that creates for us a picture of bondage, a picture of debt, of destitution. Somebody who needs to be ransomed is unable to clear the debt. Now, the big story of the Bible describes you and me as those in debt, in bondage, destitute and decaying. Sin that separates us from God leaves us in a hopeless and helpless state. We have a problem we cannot solve. We need someone to pay the ransom. That someone is Jesus the Christ. There's a plan. In order to deal with our problem, God made a plan. Now, it wasn't scribbled on the back of an envelope, like a spur of the moment, flash in the pan inspiration. It wasn't concocted as a plan B because plan A went awry. This plan, God's plan, was fashioned before the world was formed. This plan was always 
God's plan. And God was always going to deliver on this plan. And God was always going to be part of this plan. Now, last week, you might remember, we noted that the disciples struggled to understand that Jesus was actually God, up close and personal. When Jesus speaks of how the Son of Man must suffer and be rejected and must be killed, he speaks of God as man, addressing the problem that man alone could never address. A problem, a plan, a price. You see, what shocked Peter 2,000 years ago and what continues to shock and horrify people today is not simply the need for Jesus' death, but the need for such a barbaric, punishment-driven death. What kind of God allows that to happen? Well, the answer is God didn't allow it to happen. God planned and purposed it to happen. God was at the center of this plan from beginning to end. When Jesus gave his life as a ransom, it wasn't the act of a hero. This was the act of a loving God. On the cross, grace, that which we don't deserve, meets justice, that which we do deserve. You see, sin in the Bible and sin for God is a serious matter, and it requires a serious response. Hebrews 9 verse 22 says, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. The Bible speaks about blood as being the life force. A blood sacrifice in the Old Testament involved the taking of a life. And such sacrifices demonstrated how seriously sin was to be taken. God does not nor cannot overlook our sin. God can't forgive it as if it never happened. Sin represents disobedience towards God, rejection of God, and the replacement of God. And there's only one way to deal with sin, and that's through a blood sacrifice. So repeatedly in the Old Testament, animals were sacrificed an unblemished animal, a clean life for an unclean life. The animals acted as substitutes, paying the price for people's sin. But those sacrifices in the Old Testament were temporary. They didn't have lasting value. And sin was continuing to take place. So they had to be made on an ongoing basis. It was necessary for ongoing sacrifices to cover the ongoing sin. But there was a promise, a promise that God made that one day there would be the sacrifice to end all sacrifices. The one sacrifice that would meet the demands of God's righteousness, provide the forgiveness and freedom and hope to all nations and to all people, and that would come through Jesus. This is the sacrifice. This is the ransom that Jesus speaks of. Jesus had to die to pay the price of our forgiveness. As a man, he had to die. The one on behalf of the many. As God, he met his own demands, perfect and complete. In our place, Jesus was substitute. In our place, Jesus was representative. What Jesus begins to describe in Mark 8 turns a disciple's understanding of Messiahship on its head. He will die to give life. He will surrender and so overcome. He will be the servant king. So we can see Jesus pulls no punches. There can be no mistaking what Jesus the Christ has come to do. And nor should there be any mistake about what we are called to do. 
as those who believe in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. As those who profess Jesus as Savior and Lord. There should be no mistake about what we are called to do. Our little strap line is showing people Christ. Easy to remember. In that strap line, we are saying to ourselves and to the world around us that we are committed as believers in and followers of Jesus to show others He is the Christ. He's the Messiah. He's the Savior. This is the gift you need. This is the pardon you need. There's no greater service that we can do for another human being than to introduce them to Jesus. What they do with, after that introduction is between them and Jesus. But our service is to introduce them. It's a privilege, it's a responsibility, and it's a challenge. And if you look at verses 34 to 38, as we wind this up, you'll see just how Jesus unpacks that. Because he's been speaking so far to his disciples. And then he looks up and he brings the crowd in. And now he makes this as a general statement. Look at the costly actions that Jesus calls for in those who would follow him. He calls us to be selfless. Deny yourself, take up your cross, says Jesus. He calls us to be sacrificial. The one who will lose his life for my sake and the gospels, his life will be saved. And he calls us to be serious. Whoever is ashamed of me, I will be ashamed of them. And the corollary, of course, is if we are willing to speak for him, he will speak for us. You see, what Jesus will model, he calls his followers to reflect. Jesus leads the way, and we are to follow thereafter. Deny and take up envisages, well, it's, it's a real challenge to our society today. It's the counter to the me, 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 my, 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 I, 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 culture that we're part of. So often we hear people speak of, write of, proclaim and make speeches about rights. It's all about them, those who are of a like mind. What is it that Jesus says here? Deny yourself and take up your cross. That means laying down that personal ambition, that personal self-centeredness, and seeking instead to give away. You see, the gospel is a giveaway message, not a hold on to and hide away message. It's deeply personal because every one of us needs to make a decision for ourselves, but it's not private. We have no right to keep it private. In fact, if we keep our faith private, if we keep our commitment to Jesus private, we are denying him to the world. We are ashamed of him. And Jesus said, if you're ashamed of me before men, I will be ashamed of you before my Father. I, I don't know about you. I don't want to be in that place when I face Jesus and the Father and have Jesus go, I'm really ashamed of this guy. I can't speak up for him. I don't want to be in that place, do you? That's what Jesus is saying here. That's the challenge of understanding what he has done for us and understanding now what we do in response to that. You see, when you receive something, you're a very selfish individual if you don't do something in return. If May gives me a gift, the very least I can do is say thank you. If May gives me a gift, I really want to put my arms around her and say thank you. 
May gives me a gift. I want to turn to the people around me and go, this is what May gave me. What we understand, what we believe in, what we trust in, carries with it a responsibility. That's the word that doesn't get talked about. I'm sorry if this seems like a, an itch I've got to scratch, but I've got to do it. I really would love our leaders in every layer of society to start talking about responsibility and not so much about rights. And I'd really love the people who should be in that big house on the hill. I'd really love it that they took up their responsibilities instead of pontificating about their rights. But I can't make that comment if I don't take to heart what Jesus is saying to me here. I have a responsibility. You see, when Jesus sets out his stall and he makes his pitch here, he pulls no punches. I'm looking forward to having a chat with Ben this week because he has this background in marketing because it struck me that if, if a marketing consultant had got alongside Jesus before he made this pitch, the marketing consultant might have went, you know what, that's not really the way to win friends and influence people. You really want to modify that a little bit. Your language is a wee bit on the edge there. You're going to get people's backs up. You really need to kind of sugarcoat it. You need to make it more enticing. You need to make it more beautiful. You need to make it more attractive. And Jesus does none of that. He's not in the business of making good impressions. Soft sell or sugar coating. It's all out on the table. All out on the table. And here's the thing. If we stand up and stand out for Jesus, we can be assured he will do likewise. You see, this is a serious matter, folks. Faith is not a hobby. It's not a wee something we do on the side to fill in an hour and a bit on a Sunday morning. Jesus is serious about you. He went to the cross. That's how serious Jesus is about you. How serious are you about him? Serious enough to deny yourself and take up your cross? Serious enough to lose your life for him and for the gospel's sake? Serious enough to stand up, to speak up for him? And we'll let that sit with you, and I'm going to invite Betty to come and, and bring this a reflection for us.
Thank you. Bless you for that. Let's take a moment to pray. Father, we are living in your way. And in light of what we have been thinking about this morning, there are things we need to reflect on. So as I pray, I, I want to invite you just to, to pray yourself. What is it that you need to deny yourself today? What is it that God is showing you that you need to deny yourself? Ask him to show you that now. And ask him to show you what it is that's stopping you from laying down your life, for giving away life now, giving it to him. What's getting in the way of that? Ask God to show you that. And what is it that causes you to be ashamed? Or, or what is it that causes you to keep it all private? Not to speak of it. What is it? Ask God to show you what it is that's getting in the way of you standing up and speaking up for him. Father, I pray as you reveal these things to us and as you go on revealing these things, as we reflect on these words that we've been looking at this morning, the words of Jesus, I pray that as we grasp what it is that's getting in the way, so you will help us to take the steps forward that we need. That we will take up our cross. The responsibility of being followers of Jesus in the world. That we will give away all that you've given us by way of life and give it willingly. Give it full of gratitude and thanksgiving. And rather than be ashamed, we will take delight in saying, Jesus is my Savior. He's the one I follow that we will stand up and speak up, that we will serve and sacrifice in his name and for his sake. Lord, hear our prayer. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We're going to finish by singing a few verses from a, a wonderful hymn, And Can It Be?
Thanks to everybody who made today possible, um, setting up chairs and sound and music and visuals and all of that. Forgive us for any little hitches. We'll get better as the weeks go on. By the time we get to the final Sunday we're here, it'll all work perfectly. There's tea and coffee. You can head out the back door into um, back door of the hall into Thornhill and pick it up and come back through to the heat. But I want to pray a blessing over all of us. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.